Welcome on this episode of the Utah Stories program. We're talking about primitive living and primitive skills, what we can learn from our ancient ancestors, people who live Paleolithic lives. I went to a gathering, it's now been four years since I went to this gathering called Winter Cat or Rabbit Stick. And it's basically all these people who've decided, you know what, all that technology and modern stuff, I don't want any of that. I just want to make like tan skins using brains and make buckskin all day. Or I want to make uh, baskets all day. Or I want to be a flint napper. Flint napper is a person who makes um, arrowheads. And I, I went down to this primitive skills gathering because I heard that the most famous flint napper in all of Utah lived in Moab. And then I heard he had gone to this primitive skills gathering and I thought, man, that sounds kind of cool. Why not go see how people live who are basically just like, I'm done with all this computers and text messaging and this all the modern life um, noise that enters into the equation. And let's just make things simple. I'll just make something and I'll sell it and that'll be my life. And it's it was really fun to go down to this. And I want to share a couple interviews. This interview I found most fascinating it was with a, with a guy who's a brain tanner uh, basically tans hides, and I want to show you that clip now. Like wool? Yeah, th this is actually hand-woven by um, Métis out of Canada. It's traditional, you know, mountain man type mm -hmm. sash. I wanted something that was handmade. Yeah, that's great. And you did this all yourself? Oh yeah, all of it. I skinned, I skinned all the animals. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing a. We do a series of stories about how people escape the corporate world and oh. sit in front of computers or behind dashboards. I made my a, escape. It wasn't the corporate world, but I made the escape. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Seven was my first. Uh, was rabbit stick. It was my first gathering. You kind of got hooked after that. Oh my God. By the <laughs> second day, I was like, I was like a kid in a candy shop. I was just walking around like. <laughs> And by the second day, I was like, yeah, I'm going to keep coming back to the, I'm going to do winter count, I'm going to do rabbit stick, I'm going to do them every year. I've, I've lived a Paleolithic life for a while. Or, see how that looks. So anyway, very interesting gentleman, and um, and he makes his living doing that. And so I found another lady who um, makes her living weaving oh, baskets. Nice. I found more people who were interested in uh, oh, making great. arrowheads, making arrows, bows and arrows that they could go out to nature and shoot with. I found like. There were three people who won the show called Alone. It's a Discovery Channel program who were attending this the same gathering. So it's like a camp out where you basically stay for four or five days and you camp out and you learn from all these people, all these primitive skills. They actually are overflowing with attendance. They don't need, they don't need more people to attend this conference, this gathering. And I just absolutely loved it. Um, and, and I recently just had this sort of feeling like, man, as much as I love technology, I love this platform of YouTube, I love the platform of podcasts, I love the direction it's taking the media, but as much as I love the technology and I love my drone and my camera, there's a big part of me that just thinks that we are forgetting a lot by racing into modernity. I feel like we're we're racing into the future and it, while we're racing we are losing our soul. And that's a big statement to make. But I found that I'm not alone in this feeling of in the sentiment a, a listener a reader um actually recommended I read this book 
Um, another reason why I love technology. I love the comments I get from you guys. I really appreciate everything. But he recommended I read this book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. This is written by Neil Postman, who um, very, very excellent writer. And this is a very deep book, by the way. I'm only a quarter of the way through it, but I wanted to mention it because his premise, his thesis is that as we transition from a text-based society, basically reading everything from printed pages and getting most of the information we receive from printed pages into a society that's primarily visual, getting most of our information from visual moving pictures on screens, we are losing a lot of the depth of our culture and the depth of our civil discourse. And a lot of the garbage on television is not giving people a breadth or a depth of understanding of the major issues. And so I've, I, I produced, you know, the last three episodes have been about um, that, that Capitol Hill protest where I interviewed 20 people who were on the far right, you know, various regions of the right. And, uh, and I said, I don't necessarily agree with these people, but I, I think that we should listen to them and see what they have to say. Let's disseminate their ideas and break apart what they have to say. And so I talked to members of Proud Boys and the Bugaloo Boys, which I haven't released that yet, but I talked to people about the idea that the election was stolen and what ideas they thought were, were missing from the mainstream media. And it was, it was extremely enlightening just to listen to these people just to get a greater depth of understanding by sitting in front of somebody and speaking to them. And I think what we're really losing out on is one person simply speaking to another person about how they might disagree about a particular topic and doing so in a civil manner. And I think that it's just never been a worse time right now than with this isolation, with COVID. You're supposed to stay at home all the time. You're not supposed to talk to people. You're not supposed to go to gatherings. And I think that that is what's ripping our country apart right now. There's this massive distrust of the media. There's this massive distrust of the two sides of each other. Um, as I'm talking right now, they're working to impeach Donald Trump after he's out of office when President Biden says we need more, more unity. And the hypocrisy I just find unbelievable. Whether you're on the left or the right, it's it's just ridiculous. There's there's nobody who's going for unity. It's all about just I'm right, you're wrong, us versus them. And so I wanted to take a step back in this episode and let's look at more having to do with primitive, uh, prim our primitive ancestors. What do we have to learn from them? I mean, this book was written in 1985. I find it interesting that it was written at that time. Um, that was a time when my life was defined by the television shows I watched. I loved TV at a young age. I was watching um, Silver Spoons, Different Strokes. I was watching Dynasty in Dallas at nighttime. Um, I loved Mr. Belvedere. I loved, like, uh, uh, who's, the, who's the Boss? Is that the one with uh, Scott Baio? I mean, it's just all these programs... And then Nintendo, on top of that, would define my life when I was a kid. And he wrote it just basically seeing that not enough people are really examining the philosophical development of this new medium. And he points out how uh, McLuhan, um, I forgot his first name, but McLuhan coined this very, very um, profound message that the medium is the message, really. When you go on and you decide to disseminate information in a particular medium, it is actually the medium that is a big part of the message. And coming to you from a YouTube channel and from a podcast, obviously just the medium all by itself carries a lot of what it is that defines the format in which we're able to speak to each other now. And so I've chosen to embrace podcasting and YouTube videos basically because I can see the power of this medium. 
in getting people to talk to each other. I can see the power in getting the, the dissemination of ideas. But then I find as I'm out there in the world and I'm as I'm out there presenting different points of view and different topics of conversation, we are being silenced because we're talking to the wrong people who they want to label as, as we found out on Instagram, white supremacists. And because we're talking to white supremacists, supposedly, who I disagree that they are, we're now white supremacists and, and, oppose, and people should be canceling us. And so I, I go back to my point. I, I love print because of the simplistic nature of that medium. You, you print your words, you print your, your photographs in a story. It's all encapsulated and it's wonderful to read it that way. So I want to now get into um, talking to you more about how primitive people, what are the technologies we could actually take and borrow from them to improve our lives. There's actually a lot of them. I want to share those with you. But before I get into that, I want to tell you about Canyon Meadows grass-fed beef. Speaking of a, of a primitive technology, there's no better way to raise beef than on rich, thick, lush pastures where they're eating indigenous grasses their whole life, where they're not being injected with hormones and antibiotics and, and the grasses aren't treated with pesticides or fertilizers. That's exactly what you get by supporting and, and visiting Canyon Meadows Grass-Fed Beef. They have an amazing selection of beef to choose from. We've they've been a sponsor for of this program for a while now, and I absolutely love their product. If you watch our Instagram feed, you'll see that we do we smoke briskets, we smoke their, we we cook their steaks all the time. Just delicious products, and they are good for the earth. They are good for the environment, and they their products taste delicious. Go visit them right now at cmrbeef.com. Use offer code Utah Stories so that they know that we sent you, and I would greatly appreciate that. Okay, so I did a little digging. I, I was interested in, in talking about primitive skills also uh, a year ago when I spoke to a guy named Reed Robinson. He is a doctor, and he um, he's a... I believe a neuropsychologist or a neuroscientist, but he studies the brain and he basically got on the bandwagon of using psychedelics to treat depression, anxiety, um, PTSD. And he was a very interesting man to have on the program. I'll share a link of that program right now with you if you'd like to watch it. But basically what he goes into is how we really should be borrowing from the... Um, Native American people, their practice of using psychedelics to basically go on vision quests. And a vision quest is the idea that we oftentimes don't completely understand what it is we actually want from life, what it is that we actually, what is the path that we actually want to be on. And a vision quest is the, this idea of using peyote or using um, DMT or um, other uh, hallucinogens to get in touch with your your inner psyche. And he's been guiding people, patients, using, I think, primarily ketamine, um, which is completely legal now in Utah. But they're, they're decriminalizing these substances in a lot of states now. And, and he was saying this is all borrowed from ancient peoples. There was a huge amount of psychedelic use, even back when uh, this country was founded, and even back when many religions were founded, it seems like that's common to the founding of a lot of religions, is the use of psychedelics. So I got very interested in the indigenous tribes of Utah. I, I was started looking at who, who were the Fremont people. The Fremont people flourished in Utah from approximately 850 AD to about 1350 AD. Um, they were kind of an offshoot from the Anasazi culture, and they used pottery. They did farming. They farmed for beans, squash, and um, grains, and, and they did also a lot of foraging of berries. But they were displaced. That they, they basically were a farming community, but they stopped farming. They lost a lot of their territory in northern Utah, and they 
they're basically the ancestors of the Pueblo people who now live in the Four Corners region. But I was interested, especially, what did the Ute Indians eat? And how, what did, what did they eat that basically made them um, such fierce warriors and strong people? Because when the pioneers first came out here, they were amazed by the Ute Indians, and the Ute Indians were actually quite helpful. And um, there were a series of wars, of course. There was a lot of conflicts with the Ute Indians subsequent to the arrival of pioneers, mostly over territory, obviously. Um, and we, we just had a story in our last issue of the Utah Stories magazine how the beaver population in Utah was massive. And the amount of wetlands, even in arid Utah, was incredible. But thousands upon thousands of beater, beavers were slaughtered by both French-Canadian uh, trappers, British-Canadian trappers, um, and also trappers from Mexico. There were, there were all these groups of trappers coming into, into Utah, just decimating the population of the, wild, the wildlife here. So they, I mean, they kind of had a good reason to be pretty pissed off about what was going on. But what did the Ute Indians eat? And um, I had on a few months ago a guy named Dr. Joel Janetsky to get a better understanding of Native Americans' food and, and, and their foodstuffs, what they ate, what they preserved. And he said the most common foods of the Fremont Indians were, as I was saying, corn, beans, and squash, similar to the great greater Anasazi culture. But it was causing a massive amount of tooth decay of the people who ate this cornmeal bread, mostly because when you would eat it, they used sandstone matatis to smash up the corn, and you'd get little bits of the sand in your teeth, and it would wear down your teeth, and then you'd, you would just have awful teeth. And so he uh, said, but the Ute Indians were different. They did not take the time to do much with grains. They were not farmers, the, the Ute Indians were foragers, and they were hunters. And they were just like, they were not into farming. And I, and I find that very fascinating, because why wouldn't they just like do as the, as the Fremont and, and go with farming? And it was because they, they had a greater connection with the indigenous plants of the area, and they could literally get everything they needed from foraging. There was 250 different varieties of herbs and plants and medicinal herbs that they used in their diets and that they consumed all the time. And when I learned about the specifics of what these were, it was very low carb, very uh, nutritionally dense foods, and they would seasonally change their diet according to what was available. And rather than take a big piece of land cultivate it, you have to irrigate it and tend it, they did a lot more with getting nature to obey to the needs of them. So a lot of people don't understand that the Great Plains uh, Indians and, and the Great Plains and the 10 feet of topsoil that exists on the plains was there by design. It was actually the Native Americans, the Great Plains Indians, would help preserve the buffalo herd and maintain the buffalo herd migrating across the plains so that they could eat them. I mean, it was like they were essentially cattle ranchers, but they had no fences, and they didn't say that they owned specific cows. And so they would practice uh, intensive grazing of areas, these, these uh, buffalo. They would intensively graze a small area. They'd poop. They move on. I've, I've described this process before, and it was incredible how effective this was to provide far more plant and animal life then than we do today. Um, a guy who I would recommend you listen to more about this is named Joel Salatin, and uh, but it's it's amazing the way they use the natural world to accommodate their needs. We have this idea that we have to put everything inside of fences, we've got to use fertilizer, we've got to wrangle in uh, and, and rein in the technology of producing agriculture. They had the opposite idea. Let's let nature do its thing 
and we will impose on nature just some guidance and caressing. And so that's really the essence of it. But back to the Utes, what else did the Utes eat? So it turns out that they caught fish in willow baskets. They cooked them over a spit and fire. This comes from a book called Ute Peacemaker by Cynthia S. Becker. They also boned and hung their fish on poles and dried them to store for winter. John C. Fremont was one of the first explorers of Utah. He reported receiving dried fish from some Utes in his travels in 1843. The Utes also trapped river animals. They roasted beaver tail. That was a special treat. Wild grass seeds such as pigweeds, pigweed, lamb's quarter, and millet could be ground for flour to make flatbread. There was fruit in the mountains during the spring and summer. Strawberries, currants, choke cherries, plums were eaten fresh or dried for winter use. The autumn buffalo hunt was the major source of winter food. Um, the Ute women preserved the meat by cutting it into long strips and drying them in the sun. The whole family joined in a gathering of small nuts of the pinion tree in the late fall. They were picking and roasting. Um, this was a fun, festive family event. And pine nuts, of course, are delicious even today. We love pine nuts, and that's the major ingredient of pesto. Um, another treat that could be stored for traveling or winter use was made from dried crickets, grasshoppers, and, and cicadas. So they chopped up all these insects, and they mixed them with berries, and they made them into these little cakes, like little power bars. Um, that sounds interesting. I'd probably like to try that and see what that tastes like. You know, crickets are super high in protein. And there is actually a cricket bar company here in Utah. We did a story on them. I don't know how they're doing, but crickets are were an amazing source of protein. But in the in the springtime, when the grasses would first come up, that would be when they would absolutely crave the grasses, and they'd go out and they eat them, and they dig up wild carrots, the roots of seagull, seagull lily, and um, frital. I think it's pronounced fritillary. They would break. They would eat break fern, asparagus, bitterroot, wild potatoes, onions, um, and then they gathered eggs laid by duck, ducks and mud hens, and they ate blossoms of fruit such as the yucca plant, and they'd use the root for soap. So they basically just knew where to go to get what they needed, and they helped maintain the natural environment, the ecosystem, to continue to produce what they needed. So they were working in tandem with nature rather than against nature, which we typically do with industrial agriculture. And um, there's a whole big movement that is that is getting much stronger. And it's the idea of permaculture, where we actually want to create farms that are regenerative and um, that support basically an ecology that is not uh that is not imposed upon a land but it already exists there and it's something i've gotten into more and more and um and it kind of goes along the lines of this whole primitive skills gathering because i i really I, i'm not saying we need to put the brakes on modern civilization and where we're heading uh with all the technology that's about to come out but we need to consider what it is we are losing by always being in a hurry, always moving so fast, always needing to plan out every single moment of every single day. And that's what I seem to be reminded now in February because of this primitive skills gathering I went to. So I want to show you one more clip from that gathering. Um, it's, a, it's a guy I met who's a young guy, it was a sales sales person, really talented sales guy, but he decided instead of doing sales, he wanted to make bows and arrows and hunt his own food. So I'm going to leave you with that interview. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I will see you next time. We was a teacher in high school, actually, who told me something really funny. He said he worked in the Peace Corps in Borneo. And he said he decided he thought there were two different kinds of cultural mindsets about productivity. Uh, uh, one was not the Puritan mindset about productivity. And he said uh, some of the people he met in Borneo, if you showed them a technology for them to grow palm on their palm oil trees on their plantations at like double, double efficiency, so you get twice as much oil out of the same acreage. He said they would 
plant half as much acreage and maintain their lifestyle and work half as much. <laughs> huh. And um, and if they were really ambitious, they might start. They might plant like two thirds of what they've been planting and make a little more, you know. And so we, yeah, we we just instead of making our lives easier, we just increase the expectations we put on each other and ourselves with our technology. So it does make life any easier, and it dra drains our resources. All right, friends, thank you so much for watching. This program is also brought to you by Green Bike. Green Bike is a public-private partnership between UTA, uh, Select Health, and the Green Bike Organization. And it's a way for you to take Front Runner or tracks downtown without a car, but have a way for you to hop around and get around downtown. And there's never been a better time than right now to go out and support your local bars and restaurants. We have a big restaurant resurgence guide in our issue that's coming out real soon. We suggest, highly suggest, you just start getting out, especially if you're healthy. Like, get out of your house, go to the local bars and restaurants that need our support now more than ever. Pick up our, our new issue of Utah Stories, our February issue. It's about to come out in two days. We'll be distributing it all over the state of Utah. If you're interested in subscribing to the magazine, Go visit us at utahstories.com and hit the subscribe button on the digital newsletter. But if you want the physical magazine, you'll um, click on the subscribe button at the top of the navigation menu. And we'll send you a copy every month. We're, it looks like we're back to an every month schedule. We're getting on track for our March beer issue, our April health and wellness issue, our May issue is going to be concerned with um, urban farming and using maximizing urban spaces for health and wellness as well so a lot of exciting things coming up that we could share with you if you go subscribe to the utah stories digital newsletter at utahstories.com you can also get uh subscribe to our other digital newsletter our food newsletter written by ted shuffler called utah bites um where he writes about all the downtown restaurants and the culinary scene downtown top chefs all the places you want to go out and try. So with that, I'll um, see you next time. Thanks for watching.